Happy Wednesday and welcome back to the Locked On Red Sox podcast. Thank you so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen every single day. I am your host, Massachusetts Pirates team insider, Jake Ignazewski, and I'll be joined by my co-host, Nesson writer, Lauren Campbell. Lauren and I had the opportunity to interview former Red Sox player and two-time All-Star Shea Hillebrand and we talked with Shea about some of his favorite moments playing with David Ortiz, Manny Ramirez, and Pedro Martinez, as well as Shea breaks down his game-winning home run off, off of Mariano Rivera, as well as shares some of the mental struggles that he had while playing for the Red Sox. Now let's listen to our conversation with Shea Hillebrand. <laughs> Are Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are here with former Red Sox player Shea Hillebrand, who is now a real estate agent as well as a mindset-focused leader and the founder of the MLB Mindset. So how are we doing today, Shay? I'm doing awesome, man. What a great day, right? Like, I'm sure this can be recorded and sent out later, but, you know, Big Poppy getting in the Hall of Fame, that's so awesome because being able to get to play with him and see what he did uh, coming from Minnesota was really cool to experience, man. Got lots of great stories about him. Uh, super awesome. Well, what's, uh, what's the best story you got about him? He just loved to smile. He loves the game. He loves everything about it, right? So he came from Minnesota, and he was injured. He didn't play that much. Um, he had so much potential, and he had so much, uh, such a bright future. But uh, when he came to Boston, he has playing behind me. That's the best story about it. <laughs> like, he was on the bench because I was playing, and then uh, uh, Jeremy Giambi was playing. So Jeremy Giambi, myself, and then uh, Billy Miller were kind of like doing the, you know, magical chairs, you know, musical chairs, and uh, Big Poppy was kind of like the odd man out. And I think that was a real eye-opener for, for him because, as you know, he's probably thinking like, why am I sitting on the bench? These dudes suck compared to me, dude. So I think it's just like a pivotal point in his career to where I know he was around Manny and I know he was around Pedro and I know he was in a market with Boston to where um, we don't mess around. You know what I mean? So you can't just slough and, and, and do whatever you do in Minnesota and, and try to make a name of, your, name of yourself here in Boston. So he really took it serious. He took his game to the next level and, and what he did – uh, cause I DH, you know, a good part of my career too. What he did to be able to stay focused and DH and know himself and just a genius, just, just a pure storybook fantasy career of the postseason home runs. Like that's insane. I, like, like, I don't think you guys realize how dang hard it is to do what he did. And with the body that he had towards the end of his career, I mean, he got to the point where he, he really couldn't even walk. You know, he had a tough time, uh, you know, just with physically because just the wear and tear. He's a big dude and he had a bigger smile and super excited for him. I think my thing, there are so many people being like, oh, he was a DH. So that should be a knock on him for the Hall of Fame where you said it perfectly. Like he could barely walk. That doesn't mean he doesn't put in as much work as anyone or if not more work than anyone on that ball field. He still needs to stay in shape. You don't just get lucky and have a good swing like he needs to perfect that and he really took care of his body from a nutrition standpoint and obviously he was a beast um and just a larger than life personality but just because he was a dh didn't mean he was any less in shape than anyone else absolutely and uh you know what when when you're on top and when you do great things uh so many people try to do everything they can to tear you down but they just couldn't tear him down so Nope. Cool. I'm just glad I got to play with them. I mean, I mean, we we we've been the hotel after the game, and it would be Manny Ramirez, David Ortiz, Manny Ramirez as BP thrower, Eno Guerrero. They brought up from the minor leagues to be like Manny's little security blanket because Manny was really uh, he he didn't have enough a lot of self confidence in himself off the field. Super sensitive guy, super nice guy. So we'd be in in depth conversations. 
like like about hitting like like it would be like chinese to you guys it's like we're talking about approach and, and movements on pitches and analyze and angles and and this is before all the the metrics and saber metrics and all that stuff and we'd be in a depth conversation like just rocking it trying to get strategy trying to get a, a you know a one percent advantage on on our competition to make ourselves better because we're going every night and out of the blue manny would just sit there and say you know what j-lo's got a great butt and I was, <laughs> Where did this come from, man? You know, you know, Ben Affleck was dating J Lo at the time, and, she, and it's just like that's why you're so good, Manny. I hit it. You know, here. He's in his own world, Manny's land. Uh, so it was, uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, fun. So like being able to be around those two. I, I mean, growing up, David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez back to back in the lineup. I, I mean, you just kind of knew or, or sort of expected one of them was going to hit a ball out, but. Um, being able to especially be there in, in Ortiz's early Red Sox career, did, did you see uh, Manny and David's like relationship click immediately? or um, And what was like your first impression of David when, when he first like joined the team? It was – that's a great question because a lot of people don't know that. Like you, you think of the, the Bash brothers, Mark McGuire, Canseco, and, and, and you know, Jeff Kent and, and Barry Bonds in San Francisco in the 90s. But uh, both the guys are Dominican. And um, they were really close. And it was really cool to see because you saw zero competition. You saw zero jealousy. You saw none of that stuff because it's just a different mindset between them two. Then you have Pedro Martinez on the mound, who's Dominican as well. And it's the same thing there. It's just like just to see the, the mesh and the unity of, of hey, hey, Papi, I got your back or whatever. Um, it's just poetry and action. I think maybe, uh, you know, I'm not a big history buff of baseball because I don't really care about baseball that much. I just love playing it. But uh, arguably they have to be one of the top duos that, to ever play the game. I know I went to Toronto after uh, a year and a half after I, I was in Boston and playing against them was just – it was just a fun sight to see. I almost was like a front row seat fan at first base watching these dudes hit or at third base. It's like, I got the best seat in the house to watch this. I wanted to bring up the GoPro or something. Just to like, yeah. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. And then you see, you know, the, the challenges that Manny Ramirez went through um, with, with, with his performance stuff and suspensions. And it's just, it's just really sad to see because I'm telling you, man, that Manny, big pot, they're just great human beings, just good people. They definitely both seem like amazing people, kind of like what you see on TV, what you see on social media. Like that's that's exactly who they are. They don't seem like they're trying to put on a front or anything. They're just these big, big people, big, funny guys that just want to give back to the fans because that's just part of the fun and being a, a baseball player and also being part of a team like the Red Sox. And that's what you like. You hit you hit on the nose right there. Playing in Boston's like playing unlike any other place. I played on six different teams, and actually, when I got traded from the Red Sox, Mike, I felt like it was a divorce. I, I I really wanted to quit. Like my career was over after I left Boston. I mean, I was on the fast track uh, to be a hundred million dollar player. Um, I know I could have had Hall of Fame numbers, but. Uh, when I left Boston, it was it was really difficult for me to go through, and and it just it just sucked, man. And I have dreams about I have dreams about it right now, suiting back up for the Red Sox. And, and I'm 46 years old, and I don't have dreams about playing on any other team. But there's just something magical about uh, the Fenway faithful, the Red Sox nation. I I get fan mail from girls or, or, or females saying that I've watched every game with my dad since three years old. And, and it's just amazing. And, and girls in the stands holding up signs saying, will you marry me, Shay? And I'm like a seven hole hitter, six, seven hole hitter. <laughs> I'm not a franchise player. Right. And then like not Nomar or, or Pedro or Manny or, or, or big poppy. It's like, I'm just, just one of those guys that go out there and just a blue nose, hard nose player. And, and, and I had some success and, and I do autograph signings for $10,000 an hour at, at uh, Rotman's and Worcester. And girls would come to the table crying and shaking just because they got to meet me. And it's just like, this is insane, man. Like, I grew up in L.A., a diehard Dodger fan. And the consistency of that is you show up in the third inning and leave in the seventh inning to beat traffic. <laughs> and you listen to Vince Scully on the radio. So uh, being, you know, part of the Red Sox there's no other team I'd ever want to be able to experience other than that because I think I was – I mean, I had Red Sox blood running through my veins at like 
through and through, man. It's just, I have stories after stories of fans and experiences and just beautiful time of my life. I will say when you got traded, I threw an absolute fit. Like I was posting like stuff on my MySpace, on my live journal. I was heated and I was just like, no, nope, I'm never watching the Red Sox again. Like this is, th this one hurts. I was very upset about it. Well, thank you. That's great. <laughs> and, and, and hearing you say that, I, I was going through the same thing with Johnny Pesky. And, and I, I was kind of like Johnny Pesky's little guy and He'd hit me ground balls every day and at third base. And then I'd go in and we'd go in after batting practice and, and I'd get him chicken fried rice from the local Chinese China shop, Chinese food shop, and and just a just a fun experience. And and he told me that too. He's like, if they trade you, I'm never coming back. And it's like, and Johnny Pesky called me after I got traded. I'm like, Johnny, you can't do this, you know? So it's just uh I mean, it's unlike any other experience that I experienced and the other teams I plan on. There's no knock against any other teams because I was grateful for that. But there's nothing like Red Sox Nation. Like, I went back four years ago uh, to do something for the Red Sox and play, represent them in the Hall of Fame game at, at Cooperstown. And I was staying in a hotel, and my, my, my wife was – I think it was five years ago at the beginning of my relationship with my wife – and uh, checking out, uh, the girl checking out, she gave me a Boston cream pie and a handwritten note saying that she like was absolutely in love with me when I played there. She had uh, newspaper clippings put up on the wall of her bedroom over over her, and like just like she was just so enamored to be able to get to meet me. And my wife's looking at me like, "What's going on right now? This is kind of <laughs> creepy." I'm like, "Sweetheart, I was kind of a big deal when I played baseball." <laughs> so um, it just it's just uh, it gets me pumped up right now. You know what I mean? And I wish I had this smile. I wish I had this enthusiasm that I could experience because this is the real me, but I wasn't able to experience that when I played there because I had a lot of internal struggles and battles and, and ter turmoil going on that, that really drove the decisions and actions I took. And, you know, I mean, like what I said to Theo Epstein on the radio. So, um, uh, but you live and you learn and I'm just super grateful to be able to play. I mean, Boston's the best place to play bar none. <laughs> We well, hope you guys are enjoying our conversation so far with Shea Hillebrand, but Lauren just wants to take a second to talk to you about Built Bar. You know me by now. You know how much I love Built Bar. And we are in the new year, so that means you have New Year's resolutions probably. And if yours is about getting fit, maybe eating a little bit healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar and honestly, maybe even better than one. Built Bar makes it easy to stick to your resolution because they taste so good, you will want to eat it. It's not like those other protein bars that can be chalky, waxy, maybe taste kind of like a cardboard, not Built Bar. And I understand that you want to eat healthy, but it can get so boring. By like week three, I'm thinking, this just is not worth it. Where's the chocolate? Enter Built Bar, which are covered in 100% real chocolate. And here's an idea for the new year, and I've started to do this. Head on, to your, head on over to all of your secret treat stashes at home, in the pantry, maybe you have a snack drawer, at your desk, in your office, wherever. Throw out all the sugary stuff and replace them with Built Bars. So when you're craving a snack or a little treat, you can reach for something that, that's healthy and tastes incredible. And there's so many flavors to choose from. There's literally something for everyone. Coconut almond, peanut butter brownie, my personal favorite, cookies and cream, Check out built.com often to see what's new because they always have limited time flavors. And we have an offer for you. Head on over to built.com, enter promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your order. That's LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. I, I bet when, I bet when uh, you know that girl was saying that to your wife, she's like, I got to deal with them every day. Like, what makes them so special? <laughs> right? You know, she's like, seriously, dude, this is really you? You know, then, then we get in arguments or whatever. Kind of like, you know, I mean, just disagreements because that's how, how married couples do. And I'm like, only if you knew who I was. <laughs> I'm not my only defense. You know what I mean? Only if you knew who I was. I hit a game winner off Mariano. So we, I don't give a crap. Clean the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about that because I, I mean, with, with Mariano Rivera being, you know, in my opinion, the greatest closer of all time, um, it must have been a pretty incredible accomplishment, especially rounding the bases. It's it was a defining moment of my career, and at the point in time, I really didn't appreciate it. I really didn't understand it because I was in the thick of the weeds, um, you know, um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm my sophomore season, second year playing, you know, in the big leagues, being able to make the adjustments and, and it, situations like that come from how you prepare. See, you can't control the outcome of any situation that we go in unless you cheat, right? So <laughs> uh, the only thing you have control of is how you prepare yourself and how you present yourself in that situation of what you come into, a high-pressure situation or whatever that might be at work or school or, or, or any point in time in your life. And I just took pride in how I worked. I worked and I worked and I worked and and I lived in the batting cage. And when I played in Boston, the batting cage was in center field. So I lived out there and, and just worked and studied and worked and worked. And I mastered, the, I call it the focus formula, how to hit the baseball off the tee. It's like four steps. It's like, I'm going to get that direction. I'm going to look at the ball. I'm going to achieve my load and I'm going to feel it. And I just be down there just hitting line drives and line drives and preparing. And it just, you never know what's going to happen. See, so many times in our life, a lot of people wait till they get the opportunity to step to the plate and perform. And then we miss out on so many opportunities that could be defining moments in your life. I didn't know what was going to happen, but when I went to the plate that day, I, I knew we came in off the field in, in the seventh, it's the top of the eighth. I knew I had a good chance of coming up and then Manny gets, gets on, he's on second base. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, dude, like, I, it was weird because when I was getting ready, it's like the feeling that I had was like so pure peace and like confidence and like just surreal. And, and as I'm walking up the steps of the dugout and onto the field, it's like I'm making my way to the on deck circle and the, just the buzz of the crowd like stirs a feeling inside myself that what I'm about to do has already been completed. It was eerie. So when you train and you work and you know how to train and train your focus and go out there and get confidence through that process, when you compete, your intuition kicks in. So now there, you just work off pure self-confidence and just go. So I'm standing in the on deck circle. I'm like, man, this feeling right here is a feeling that all professional athletes train countless hours for just to try to seek on a consistent basis. I mean, Manny and Big Poppy didn't have to work as hard as we did, but it's like, that's what we're trying to achieve to go out there and have success on stage against the evil empire, right? So now I hear my name bellowing through the speakers at center field, like now batting number 29, Shay Hillenbrand. And I'm walking to the plate. I already went through my pre-flight checklist like a, like a fighter pilot does before he takes off in his high-performance jet into combat. Like I've already processed all, and I'm walking to the plate and it's crazy because Mariano's on the mound, the greatest closer of all time. Here's the Yankees. Here I am one year removed from being a rookie. And this is what I trained for. And this is what I envisioned in the front yard and in the backyard as a kid, like bottom of the ninth, two outs, bases loaded, World Series or game winning or, or Ulster, whatever. I'm walking it out real time. But I've trained countless hours, hundreds of thousands of swings. I never just walked to the plate. I couldn't do that. I've trained so many times just for this moment. And when I step in the batter's box, I'm like, okay, I already have my game plan set. He has a cutter that's like this much to this much. And what's going to happen, he's going to throw it out over the plate. I'm going to hit a line drive in the right center field like I've done with him all the time because he's going to try to beat me because that's his number one pitch. I'm going to score Manny Ramirez from second base. I'm going to tie up the game. And then it's gonna, the crowd's going to go crazy. And it's going to be like, Shay, 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 Shay. So I step in the batter's box in the first pit. I go, when you're in the batter's box as a major leaguer, it's, you just focus on three things, guys. When do I start? read the pitch, and then react. When do I start? So I just go through my little three-step focus formula. When do I start? Mariano comes up because he comes out of the stretch. I start. Read the pitch. Holy crap! He threw me in an inside corner and he missed miss. I'm like, whoa! He's never thrown this to me before. So now the count gets 1-1 uh, one, one, and then uh, he throws it back inside again and it just misses. 94 miles an hour on the inside corner of the plate. When we're hitting in the batter's box, we know what's a ball and what's a strike. We can tell. Like, like we're so laser focused, the catcher and the pitcher. Like, we know. We don't need an umpire. But the umpire zones vary, so it just depends on the, on the umpire. So the ball barely misses the inside corner of the plate, and it could have gone either way. And I step out, and the umpire calls it a ball. And then Jorge Posada is catching, and he proceeds to throw the ball back to Mariano. And if you guys ever see a catcher, 
if he's if his body's facing the field and he's throwing the ball back or whatever and he has his head turned to the side, guess what he's doing? He's, he's cussing out the umpire. I say he's talking. He's saying some bad words. <laughs> he's cussing out the umpire. He's like, "Come on, Mariano needs this effing pitch. Are you effing kidding me? What the hell is going?" On? And I'm standing out there like, "Mariano doesn't need it. Are you freaking <laughs> kidding me right now, dude? Like, like, like if you look at the situation, I have like." No chance at all, 1%, because he is that good. So finally, I worked the count to two and two. The next pitch after that was 2-1. The next pitch after that, he throws it right here. And that's what he's trying to do to me. And I swung through it. Now the count's 2-2. Two, two. And I'm riding and dying on my approach. I'm not sitting in the batter's box like, oh, what if he does this? If he throws it here, I'm not. And so many of us do that. We let the self-doubt creep in all the time. No. I'm riding and dying on this. If I go down, I'm going down fighting. I'm going down with my approach set. I have conviction. I have training. I have understanding. When do I start? Read the pitch. React. He threw that ball in, and it was about waist high. And I saw it, and I reacted. I instantly see the ball sailing over the Green Monsters 2002 before they had the seats up there right in the net. I take two steps out of the batter's box and I was like, yeah! Like you see, like I'm fist pumped. Not because I was pimping, not because I thought I was bad at it. Manny and Big Poppy could do it. I can't do that. I was just more surprised than anybody in that stadium. I'm like, this is insane. Like this is like a, like a storybook, like dream. I felt like I was in a dream. And I felt like a David beating Goliath. I'm rounding first base and the ground's shaking. Shaking because the, I thought the stadium was going to collapse. I'm like, dude, y'all chill, dude. Like this, this place is built in 1900. It's going to fall out. You know what I mean? Like the Fenway failed. It's going nuts. And the commentators couldn't commentate because the stadium was so loud. Like call play by play uh, about that. And I'm, I, I just round the bases. And it was all of, of what Shea Hillenbrand did. It wasn't about what, what the team just did because it was an eighth inning go ahead, ultimately a game winning home run. But it's what this is what Shea did. And what I realized is that, man, here I am, the first guy, Red Sox player, to hit a game winner off Mariano at Fenway Park. And all my teammates went out that night with arguably the best fans of baseball. And, and what did I do? I, I, I went straight home. I, I didn't allow myself to celebrate. Um, I was in such a tough spot with the stories that I told myself and how if I just go out there and just get one more, the fans will love me. If I just get a little bit more money here, uh, my parents will be, I'll have approval from my father. If I just do this over here, I kept trying to get a, you know, external success and achievements uh, for, for love and connection. And, and on my drive home, I'm like, gosh, that, that, that pain is, is still there from that story that I would continually tell myself of I'm not lovable and I'm not good enough. And my dad doesn't love me. And, and, and what I realized through this process is like the next day I woke up and that pain was so severe. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I just, I got to go back and perform tomorrow. But what's crazy is that what we don't really realize is that when I go to the park, the stadium, Fenway, I'd have a hitting coach. I'd have a, a fielding coach. I'd have a strength coach. I'd have a mental coach, a, a, a mental sec you know, performance coach. I'd have a, a, a chef. We have a chef. We have uh, orthopedic surgeons. We have massage therapists, a chiropractor. We have trainers. We have anything and everything you ever want as a performer. Like they just, that, that's what you do because it's a billion dollar industry. But every time when I left that stadium, because I lived outside the city, um, when I left the confines of, of Fenway Park, I, I didn't have anybody. I didn't have a coach. I didn't have a mentor. I had no one to confide in. I, I didn't think anybody could understand what, what I was going through. And, and, and maybe that might help some people to put some back context to, to maybe understand like some of the decisions I made or actions I took or, or things that I did. I mean, if you just Google my name, like, like I have a picture on the internet that says, do not want. Shay's the cancer of the clubhouse. He, he, he's a bad teammate. I was. I tried to do as much as I could on the field, but I didn't know how to communicate with people. I didn't have a voice. I didn't have understanding. And I was always told, if you just hit the ball, just, just hit, we'll, we'll find you a spot and you'll get to the big leagues. And that's what happened. But when I went to the big leagues with the Red Sox, ultimately, ultimately what I was trying to achieve was getting approval and love from my father. 
I think it's very important and admirable that you share something so deep and personal because like you said, when you hit that off Mariano Rivera and you were just so excited, you had that excitement, you had pretty, you probably felt like you were on top of the world right then doing that against the Yankees, having Fenway just go absolutely nutso. But then, like you said, you, you go home and you just feel so alone and it, people need to remember that athletes are human beings. We see athletes as these superheroes, these immortal people that they they have feelings too. They have struggles just like you and me. Um, they have who knows what kind of issues because they're if they talk about it, it's like, oh, whoa, like why are they talking about personal stuff? Because they have these platforms to do so. And now that you're, you know, you're, you're able to be open about it now, I think that's so important because you were on the Red Sox, a storied franchise. You played with Ortiz, you played with Nomar, you played with Johnny Damon, Jason Baratek, and anyone. No, 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 no. They, they got to play with me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my bad. My, my mistake. They got to play with you. <laughs> but you still, you know, you still had these feelings of, of doubt and just like, loneliness and I, I feel like you know people just be like well why do you feel like that you have the best job in the world it's like oh sorry i forgot my job dictates everything about my life <laughs> you're 100 correct and and a person like myself uh, each and every night i went out i uh i didn't want to let the fans down because they were more family to me than, than my own family and i just i live and died on the field and and having the roller coaster of, of failing and winning and losing and, you know, going out there and performing and on the radio, Oh, they're going to trade you now or whatever. And it's just like, uh, you, you put yourself in a box in a zone and, and you try to manage it the best you can, but we're not really, I wasn't really equipped for that. Um, uh, being able to understand how to navigate that place. I always made a pact with myself guys that when I took a picture with people, you'll never see a picture with me ever taking a picture with the fan and not smiling. And I always made a pact with myself because I never knew what a fan might be going through in their life, the turmoil, and maybe being one breath away from giving up and maybe getting that opportunity to get to meet me and me making them seen from somebody that they wouldn't think that they'd be seen from and just pure to give that smile to them. Um, that I always made a pact of that because I know how that feels. And Matter of fact, I'm flying to the All-Star Game in 2005 when I was playing for a Toronto Blue Jays. I'm in a Citation 10 private jet. And this is the fastest civilian jet in the world. I'm flying from Chandler, Arizona to Detroit, Michigan. And uh, pilot, co-pilot, myself, multi-million dollar jet, going to my childhood dream, getting ready to play in front of hundreds of millions, hundreds of, millions of people that next day. And I'm looking out the window on the way there by myself. I didn't have any distractions, no entourage, no friends, no family, no kids. It was just me by myself. And when I'm looking out the window, it was nothing but quiet desperation. It was, is this all it is? Is this, is this what it's about? I, I, I hate everything about this because I didn't know who I was before I became a professional baseball player in that market and then making my way up to the major leagues, being the first guy to go from double A to triple A for 30 years. I was the first player to do that. And then the last player since me is Jackie Bradley Jr. And once I'm in the big leagues, I'm just like, I don't even know how I'm here, but I'm going to do everything I can to attach my identity to that because I don't know who I am. And when you do that, it just leads you down a, a road of toxicity. Uh, you can't sustain it. You might be able to achieve success, but if, if you don't know who you are, like, like I did, what you do is, is you rely on an ego. See, see, my ego was stroked so much. My ego was so great. I actually missed out on the biggest opportunity I had playing Major League Baseball. See, the biggest opportunity I had wasn't making tens of millions of dollars or hitting a game winner off Mariano or, or all the highlights I did and being in the perfect game and two no hitter. Like all the, the biggest opportunity I had was using that platform to use my voice to inspire and impact the world. And that's pretty much the one thing that, you know, I, I don't know if I regret it, but it's one of those things where it's like, if I would have been able to understand that, it would have been a game changer for myself. We hope you guys are enjoying our conversation so far with Shea Hillebrand. But I just want to take a second to talk to you about Bet Online. There might be less football being played, but betonline.net 
has way more stuff to be bet on this playoff season from scored totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land. Bet online is the number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. It's not just football. BetOnline.net's basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC odds coverage is the best in the business. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, BetOnline is your number one online waging destination. BetOnline, the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and play your favorite games. BetOnline, where the game starts. I, I I think it's amazing what you're doing right now, Shay, and um, especially since you have been able to find yourself and find your true passion out, outside of baseball. You know, especially since 22, 2022 has start, started. I think I think I messaged you about this, but um, it's I, I love the amount of content that you're putting out and all, all the all the stuff that you're talking about because it's it's so so important, especially right now. And you know, Lauren brought it up perfectly, and you know, I believe this in this. Um, so so heartedly that you know athletes are humans as well and you know people don't get to see that and being able to i think red sox fans being able to hear from you and and hear the struggles that you went through not only during your time in boston but during your mlb career um i i think that they're going to take a lot out of this yeah and i hope they do and, and as you guys are saying this and as we're traversing through this conversation i, I don't want anybody to think like I'm, you know, making excuses or, or, or trying to justify anything or, or whatever. None of that stuff. It's just kind of given the behind the scenes perspective, a player's perspective of what I went through. And it seems to be a common thread of people, players that I'm helping out now that, that have left the game and identity and stuff like that. And, and, and it's, and it's challenging because it's like, well, you're a major league baseball player, man. You got tens of millions of dollars. Like pull up your bootstraps, bro. Like, like I got to work 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week to put food on the table. And, and I'm more die hard than you. And I get that. And I understand that. And uh, it's just, we're human beings and it's all good, man. Like, like, man, I, when I got traded May 29th in 03, I was leading the team in RBIs. I had 49 in two months and Manny had 47. I was hitting seventh, and they would always get on base, Tech and Manny and Trot, and I'm just like, bat, 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 just driving them in, you know what I mean? So uh, um, it was cool. Cool, too. I mean, cash and paychecks? Come on, man. It's a lot of money. <laughs> it, is, it is a lot of money, and it's a lot of, you know, star power that that you played with. And you mentioned that, you know, the, the fans felt like family to you. Um, is, is there, if there was, like, a, one maybe message you could give – them whether it's now or you know back during your time with boston what would that be because during that time no one really knew what you were going through ride these players asses because they're <laughs> rookies don't let them fall man ride them hard man the hardest i'm just joking <laughs> uh, the, 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 i always tell people that the 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 toughest feeling in the world that i've ever experienced in a major league baseball field was playing third base and have a routine ground ball go through my legs at Fenway Park and don't touch my glove. Talking about wearing it. Like, it was like, ah, I know, I am. Yeah, keep going. Yep, yep. But you ain't going to question my, my my integrity. You're not going to question my effort. You're not going to question me coming up in, a, in late in the game and putting that damn ball in play and coming through in these situations, these pressure situations more times than not. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's – baseball's it's 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 a culture out there i mean in boston i'm in arizona now and i've been out here the whole time and and uh i man i i wish i would have been able to be in a better spot to to really immerse i never wanted to leave boston i wanted to play in boston my whole career i would have been man i would have been a janitor i would have been a raker i would have been worked the field i would have da i don't care man like i never wanted to leave but i just didn't fit into uh the parameters of how theo epstein uh, presented, you know, and, and, and played the game and formulated a team. Well, like you also, you also played before the curse was broken as well. And you, you know, you hear a lot of people from a lot of people after 2004 and, you know, their experience playing at Fenway, but I mean, you, you were in the heart of, you know, the, when they started winning a little bit, but from 2001 to 2003, you know, when the Red Sox came so close uh, multiple times in the early 2000s. So, I mean, especially like the pressure that you went through, but like also like what was the energy every single time you walked down on Fenway Park um, from Fenway Faithful? 
it's uh it's it's unlike anywhere else that I've played. Um all due respect, I don't even think New York can compare um to what happens at Fenway Park or what happened at that time at Fenway Park. I mean, it's just it, i mean, I I'd I'd ground out and I'd run hard to first and I'd be going back to the dugout and the fans in the front row. It's all right, Shay, let's go. We got him. We'll get it. It's all good. Um I lived out that pressure. I was built for that pressure. Um, I love that environment. Uh, there are some players that, that, that have challenges playing in, in an environment like that, but I just, oh man, I thrived, man. It just, uh, it was cool. I mean, if I think baseball, I think Red Sox and, uh, it was a great memory. I mean, I remember us going on. I played there right before they renovated everything too. And I remember us going on a rain delay when Pedro was pitching and he's at his locker and, and it's downpouring. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, the, the drop ceiling was kind of like caved in because it was watering and, and electrical wires were hanging down and like, zzz, 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 and two or three of us like jumped on Pedro, like secret service to the president. We're like, Pedro, I'll take it for you. Don't hurt Pedro. You know what I mean? So, uh, I mean, it's just like playing with him and tech tech's a student of the game. I always called him a nerd because he's always studying in the clubhouse, doing his game plan, all that stuff. And, and uh, being part of the dirt bags, you know, the original uh, dirt bag crew with, Brian Dabak and Trot Nixon and myself and Lou Maloney and, and, and all that. I mean, being able to play with Nomar. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it was cool. I, I'm just bummed out that I wasn't able to fully uh, be able to be there and fully, because because the greatest battle I ever fought wasn't between the lines each night under the lights on ESPN with Stephen A. Smith talking crap about me to be able to get uh, ratings or or the fans or, or whatever. It, it was the internal battle that I fought. And, and I think that's transparent and that translates to so many people, your listeners right now. The biggest battle we'll ever fight is not out there with our job or relationships. It's an internal battle. And, and what I discovered through this process is that you know, Oprah said it best. You're you're in charge of filling yourself up and keeping yourself full. And you got to work harder on yourself than you do your job. And and you know, when you get to be, you know, a celebrity or, or, or a very successful professional athlete, you don't really have to work on yourself. That, that's not required. You, you're required to go out there and perform. And if you perform, you know, everything else can you know do whatever. You know, as long as you don't get too crazy. But if you don't work on yourself, you can't reach your full potential and, and be able to. Uh, go out there and achieve uh, success without with, with fulfillment because I was the ultimate poster poster child for that. Like success without fulfillment is ultimate failure. I couldn't find fulfillment. One of the things that my therapist told me years ago that really stuck with me was like, you are competing with no one except yourself. Like there is no competition out there except that person in the mirror. And I wish I, I wish I found this woman earlier, <laughs> like earlier in my, like maybe my late teens or my earlier twenties, but um, hearing you say that, it's just, you know, it's when you have all this this pressure on you and you you have so much high expectations of yourself, but you also know there's so much outside noise. There's so many amazing baseball players out there, but it's like, I'm not competing with them. I'm competing to be the best version of myself, to be the best player, teammate, and person I can be. Because once you fully commit to making yourself uh, the best version of you, you're fully there. Like you are already better than the person you were yesterday. Hundred percent, and uh, I did that. I mean, I, when I went to play in San Francisco, I hit in front of Barry Bonds, and and I never competed against him. I didn't compete against Manny, or I, I can't. These guys are like superhuman, and and you know, I always say like, there's a level system, you know, and and I, and I was operating like on a level seven out of ten, like like to be able to uh, go out there and perform, and but man, I mastered level seven. Like I did everything I could, and. And you got these other guys that are playing at tens and elevens, and like they're 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 off the spectrum. They're that good, and it's crazy because like, how do you get a guy like myself at a level seven to go out there and not compete against, but have success against level tens, eleven, and twelves? And and that's what it is. It's it's about focusing on the right things and training and going out there and putting yourself in a position to to gain that self confidence. See, I had self confidence on the field, but when I left the field, uh, I didn't have any self confidence. Matter of fact, I remember times I'd hit game-winning home runs or go-ahead home runs in New York, 40,000 with the Red Sox. Like, it's crazy. And uh, being an ESPN and I could step to the plate. I had the third highest active batting average in Yankee Stadium when I played behind Paul Konerko and Ichiro Suzuki and then Shea Hillenbrand. Like, like I thrived in that situation. I don't know why. I thrived in that. I could step to the plate and come through. And, and then 
after the game, I'd go out in New York, five-star restaurant with my friends and family and a $4,000 meal I'd pay for it and just be there. And I'd be on ESPN and, and I'd sit there at the table and I couldn't step to the plate at the dinner table. Like I'd almost pee my pants every single time because I had fear to get up from that table and walk across the restaurant to use the restroom and fear of everybody else staring at me because I had no self-confidence or no self-esteem as a person i.e. hence why you saw me do the things that I did that were kind of out of characters because I'm just protecting that little crying damaged little boy inside me that that wasn't addressed or taken care of when, when I was a kid and that's just the stories that I created it wasn't I didn't grow up in a bad environment it's just the stories I created from experiences that were in my environment that I just didn't understand yeah, and you know, so, so many times, like the the stories that we tell themselves can can really haunt not only our, like you said, our confidence, bring up self doubt, and also also the things that we learn through our adolescence, learn through you know external things such as society and and everything like that. But you know, you brought up New York, and I I gotta ask this, especially since you, when you played for the Sox, that was when the rivalry was like at its peak, in my opinion, at, at least at least when I when I was alive. So. Um, being able to play against the Yankees, like what was that energy like? And then, and then also like what was like the hate between the players? Was that actually real or did you actually have some good relationships with some of the players? Sorry to bust your guys' bubble. It's, I don't know. I, I can just speak for myself. I mean, I think, you know, baseball is a small fraternity. There's only 750 guys in the world that do it. And uh, you know, when you're on the field competing, like you just want to stomp on their throats. Right. But you know, Jeter would get on first base and I'm like, dude, Jeter, I'm not, I'm not trying to hit on you or anything, dude, but like your eyes are freaking amazing, bro. Like he had electric blue eyes that are like, like just like, like perfect. Then he's like, come on, Shay, stop that crap, man. You know? And then Giambi would get on first or Posada or, or Bernie Williams or, or Polly, whatever. It's just like, you know, you have that respect of, of, of who they are. I mean, I remember walking into the stadium at times and then even the police officers like just cussing us out and like, like hated us. You know what I mean? And just like, dude, like, I'm a Dodger. Like I grew up in LA, man. I'm just like, this is my job, you know? And, and uh, I remember like, I didn't realize when you're a rookie or played for the Red Sox, you have to check into the hotel under an alias name or else crazy stuff happens. So uh, it's three in the morning. We're, we're in the nice hotel in New York and I get a call on my hotel room phone. I didn't know if it was somebody back home, my wife or family or whatever. And I like, I wake up out of a deep sleep and, and I'm like, hello. And then I say, other than the line, it's a Yankee fan saying, Hillary and you effing suck. I'm like, what? Are you serious right now, dude? Like, you guys got nothing better in your life to do? It's just, uh, uh, it's fun to like go sit out in right field or left field uh, next to the wall during batting practice and the fans just, just, they just wear you out. And it's just like, just go at it all the time. And then one day I was walking out of the dugout in New York and you, once you come out, like as a Red Sox player in New York, like you have your tunnel vision on. Like we hear everything that goes on, just to let you guys know. We hear everything, but we've trained ourselves just to kind of like just block it out, block it out, block it out. So I hear a voice, a little voice, like from a six or seven year old kid over the dugout in New York. And it said, Mr. Hillenbrand, Mr. Hillenbrand, man, please have your autograph. And I'm like, well, what the heck is this, man? This is way out of context. And I turned around and it's this little boy with a Yankee snow cap on, a Yankee big old polo, like big, flip, big Parker jacket, and it's all decked out in Yankee gear. And I was like, yeah, I guess. If, uh, I, I've never signed an autograph for a Yankee fan because you guys – so anyways, I'm signing it for a little Johnny, and, and, he, and he leans over. He's like, just to let you know, Mr. Hillenbrand, I'm really a Red Sox fan, but I'm too scared to wear my Red Sox stuff in Yankee Stadium. So it's just like the, just the, the, the cutest thing ever, you know what I mean? And, and, and then I never have fans cuss at me and yell at me when I hit a go-ahead home run off Mike Messina or whatever, but um, there's nothing like it. Not, I don't know other sports, but there's definitely nothing like it in, in baseball. That rivalry is insane. Police escorts, you got to be careful at the hotels. You can't go, you know, all that. Like, it's it's cool. I just wish I played in the postseason. I wish I played in the World Series for the Red Sox because I guarantee you I would have freaking rocked it. In 03, when they lost uh, in the ALDS for the Yankees, the Red Sox, like, I had players call me saying, like, because that's when I got traded. They're like, if we would have had you, we would have won. I'm like, thanks for telling me that, man. That sucked. <laughs> Here in Arizona, you know what I mean? Playing with the mascot because no one's around. <laughs> 
I hope you guys did enjoy part one of our conversation with Shay Hillebrand. And also make sure to check out part two tomorrow. But we want to thank you guys so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen every single day. Now make your second listen Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets, hosted by your boy Q, with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. And also make sure to go over and give Locked On Red Sox a follow on Twitter. It's LO underscore Red Sox because we post Red Sox content every single day and try and get you guys involved in every single episode that we post. Also follow myself on Twitter. It's at Jake Iggy as well as my co-host Lauren Campbell. That's la 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 three laws Lauren with four R's. Now, like I said before, make sure to check out part two of our conversation with Shea Hillebrand because he explains his incredible personal transformation that he's had during his post-baseball career, as well as as well as well explains what happened during the Theo Epstein scandal and explains what he's learned throughout his mental struggles. And we thank you guys so much for tuning into Locked On Red Sox each and every single day. And we'll see you guys and talk to you guys tomorrow. Peace.